Well, it's fall. Believe it or not, it's here again. So fall for the Christian household or the Christian clan, as we say, kind of hits like this. So even though we homeschool, kind of fall introduces a new season in our household, which just means that no longer can uh, the kids just get up whenever they want to and just kind of lackadaisical go about through their day. Instead, my wife prints out their schedule and early in the morning, they got to get right at it. And so in our house, then that kind of switches us to kind of more routine, more uh, probably a little bit better, more healthier habits. So as we begin uh, the series today, we kind of look at that because just as we know as a family, when this kind of time rolls around and we started getting these better habits, when we have bad routines in our lives, we can't expect positive outcomes. So when we were talking about the sermon series, that's kind of what we wanted to do through here. Because see, what the elders have told us is that while it's important to still track, you know, our attendance and how much we give, those kind of things, the things that churches normally track. Instead, they wanted to start looking at, you know, really what does it mean to be a healthy Christian church? So since we're changing season, like what, well, as we begin this fall season, what are some ways as, a ch as individuals and as a church family that we can kind of fall back into some positive routines? So through this series, we're going to cover giving of ourselves, which means just, of course, giving our, like, our times and talents, living generously, what are we doing with our treasures, engaging heavily in worship, so how are we praising God in various ways, and deepening community, how are we getting more involved in each other's lives and in our community? So thinking about those healthy, positive metrics, we're gonna start off the series talking about giving of yourself. And what does that mean to be a servant for Christ, to be under his job description for us? And so as we look at today, we're gonna to talk about the servant, the service, and the sacrifice. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come together with my brothers and sisters. What, how great it is this day that you have made and you have allowed us to come together in this place not because we have a building, but because we have sisters and brothers who have decided to come together and just give you all the praise and the worship. How awesome it is to serve you, God. Help us today, Lord, just to hear from you. Lord, I ask today that it not be my words, but it be yours. Lord, we just ask that you take center stage. Amen. So years ago, when I first got into homeless outreach, I met this really cool guy. He's about the same age as I was. And when I showed up to serve one day, we're loading food bags in the back of his truck. You know, and I just kind of, I didn't know him well. So I was kind of doing the, the normal, you know, the normal conversation stuff. And I just asked him like, hey, what is it that you do for a living? And he goes, well, what I do for a living is serve God. Now, if you're asking me what I do for money, well, I do construction. And I was just at that moment, right? It kind of blew my perspective about what serving means, about who I am. Because of course, at the time, having a DOD job and just thinking like, okay, well, that's who I am. That's what I do. I mean, at first, I mean, when we were wrong, when he kind of says, I was kind of taken aback, like, who are you? You know, kind of thing. But when I thought about it later, I thought like, oh, well, man, like how, how affirming is that? And as a brother, he was kind of calling me on the carpet saying, and that's not really what your job description is. So forward to today, me being an outreach minister, all my job really is for the most part, I get to come up here and preach to you every once in a while. Thank you, appreciate that. But I also essentially just try to open up opportunities for us to engage our community on a deeper, maybe more focused level. Really, it's about to get the Sunday seats out into the Monday streets. So how do we focus? How do we serve better? How do we engage on deeper, more powerful levels? So how do we get more organized? I think it's about looking at that job description because I think outreach can be done wrong, right? Because it can kind of be haphazard. It can kind of be insensitive at times. So how do we really engage our community on a deeper and a more abiding level? Because see, our job description as Christians is to serve others. It's really that simple. I think at times as a faith family, we try to make this a lot more complicated than it has to be, right? But it's not. 
It's all about serving others. And some of you guys do it incredibly well. So we're going to look as a kind of cornerstone to the sermon today. We're going to look at Luke 9, 23 through 25. It says, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. And so what we're going to look first is about the service. And we're going to look at this piece, deny myself. And what does that mean? Now, kind of just the first glance at it, I think deny myself. I kind of think of like, man, I'm on a strict diet. I can't have that cupcake. But it's not really just about denying yourself the cupcakes. It's really, it's about denying who you were before coming to know Christ. It's about denying who you said you were prior. So before I met that outreach guy in the back, loading, loading a truck up, right? I thought to myself like, okay, well, who I am was DOD, you know, serving the military, etc. But then after meeting him, I go, man, that's not really my job description, is it? It's all about serving God, denying of myself. And essentially that just means that no longer are we the Lord of our lives, but we proclaim who the Lord is, amen? And when we have that job description, it takes a focus solely away from who we are, solely from the self, and moves it to focusing on Jesus. Essentially, this is gonna be a kind of a tidbit. You go ahead and tweet this, Instagram, whatever you gotta do. Forget about me and focus on thee. Forget about me and focus on thee. And to deny ourselves when we do that, when we focus, take the focus away from me and put it on thee, then we get to deny ourselves and then we get to walk out three important things, humility, patience, and love for others. These are representations of who we are as servant, who God is calling us to be. Scripture is really clear about this because you read it over and over and over again. It talks about we're supposed to be meek servants. We're supposed to be humble ourselves for the service, to be servants. And there's a lot of times, I think that, you know, even, of course, being here on staff, being a minister, sometimes those things kind of get mixed up a little bit as far as your job description because people will go, oh, you're a minister, you're a pastor, and they kind of take a deep breath. Remember in the military when I was uh, talking to one of the other chaplains, they knew you were a Christian, and they'd kind of like a soldier would come by, he'd actually say a cuss word, and he's like, oh, you know what I mean, kind of deal, and, and he goes, oh, no, I cuss in front of, uh, of a Christian, and like I could smote them or something. It's smoted, and they're just gone, right? But that's not really what it's about, right? God has given, sure, us a position and us a job to do, but it's the same as anybody else because there's no greater or lesser value within the kingdom of God. If you're a minister, you're a minister. So right now, we have six full-time staff, seven part-time staff, and there's everything from like preaching to worship to kids' ministry all the way from cleaning the bathrooms, but one's not less important because trust me, you would feel that if you walked in and the bathrooms were dirty, I would probably hear about it. So there's none that is lesser or greater. All are called to do a positive work because see, once you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then your job description has changed and you become invaluable to God's kingdom, amen? Invaluable to God's kingdom. I want you to go ahead and turn, your, turn to your neighbor, say, hi, minister. You guys are not doing this with a lot of kids. You say, hi, minister. All right, next, next, I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you with a little grandiose in your voice and go, huh, I'm valuable. <laughs> Come on now, go, go to the other person, I'm valuable. <laughs> but I want you also to look to your neighbor, and I want to say, you're valuable. You're valuable. There is no one lesser. So I think a lot of times, you know, we have our two lead pastors on staff, both Bill and Gary. And let me tell you from a personal walk with them and getting to see them on a daily basis, both of them are what I would call servant leaders, right? They lead through service. And I just, and it doesn't have to look back. You look back at our Hawthorne day of service and both of them were out picking up trash, raking mulch and leaves and limbs and power washing the side of a building. Now I'm assuming that if we go and look at the job description that the church gave them, I'm going to assume any of those things are probably not on their job description, right? But they're still out there doing, they're still being those servant leaders. So that is what we're called to be. And they kind of exemplify what we'd see in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. 
Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. That's so awesome. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ and everything to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. There we go. Everybody's starting to participate today. I'm going to, I'm going to like today. All right. So everybody has a job to do. Everybody has a job description. So when God paid the ultimate sacrifice and you came to know him as your Lord and savior, he said, okay, I'm going to take the job description that you have made for yourself that you have written up. And then I'm going to give you a brand new, new one. A one that just speaks about how do we go and serve others. Because everyone is given gifts and talents. So we're going to, I'm going to bug you one more time. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you need me. (laughs) Come on, conviction, (laughs) you need me. But I also want you to look at your neighbor and I want to say, I need you. Oh, we got that humble part in there. And I got some good looks in there. That's good. We're still online camera. We can see some of those. You guys are precious. All right. So when I talk to some of, uh, a sing- when I talk to single people and I said, they were asking for any kind of advice. And I said, if I was single again, then the one thing that I would look for is somebody who serves the church on a regular basis. And this is pretty simple, right? I mean, it's common sense. Somebody who serves the church on a regular basis was probably going to do really well serving a spouse, and serving a family. And it's kind of what a lot of times, hopefully, I'm going to be able to instill in my kids. And so when I was new to the faith, I didn't quite understand this, but see, I just got lucky, right? I got my wife, who was already serving the church for many years, really good parents who kind of showed the value of service, and she kept that going. And when I met her, she was already in that process. And I benefit from that greatly because of how well she serves our home. And if you don't know all the things she do, I mean, she does a lot, and she's incredibly smart. And when she's serving, she's never looking for, like, where's the glory and honor in all of this for me? She just does so each and every day humbly. Because as a pastor's wife, there's no parades. There's often not a lot of recognition when it comes to being a pastor's wife. She carries a ton that a lot of people don't see because she's got to put up with me to begin with. Yeah, that's right. You can laugh because it's true. Then she puts up with my hectic schedule, and then she puts up with all the drama that goes on behind the scenes, the days that I'm frustrated, the days I'm scared, the days that I might not want to be a minister anymore. And she sits there, and she talks me through those things, and she loves on me. She serves well. When we talk about that new job description, we talk about that. What does it mean to serve well and to serve humbly, patient, and with love? And in Mark 10... You have brothers James and John. Oh, pardon me. Appreciate it for that water break. James and John both approach Jesus and they're asking him, say, hey, like, really, he goes, who is going to sit on you, sit, sit at your left and right in heaven? Like, we want that, that job. And Jesus just goes, listen, you're, if you want those kind of honor, you're going to have to essentially pay the same kind of, you're going to drink, the, he says, drink from the same cup I do. In other words, pay for the same, pay the same way I did. And then when the other disciples heard James and John trying to like politic and like trying to get on the good side, they all surrounded James and John and they started this big argument. And then Jesus calls them and sets them aside. And in 42 through 45, says, Jesus called them over and said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, but it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great among you will be a slave to all. That's a heavy dose of reality right there. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here we go. The King of all kings, Jesus is telling his disciples, listen, you're, you're calling me teacher, you're going to call me Lord, but I didn't come to be served. I came to serve as a ransom for many. So that's where we sit in our job description. We go, well, where are we at in this job description? Is that we do not sit around and hope to be served, but instead we move to be served. Serving is all about Jesus, being a servant, is solely focused on Jesus. 
Serving is not about who you are. It's about who Jesus is. It's all right. You can participate today. This is a full participatory mode right here. All right. All right. Serving is not about who we are, but about who? I like hearing the name Jesus. It's about who Jesus is. It's about denying ourselves and carrying that servanthood and that job description out in service. So as we look at service and we look back at, at Luke 9, 23 through 25, says, anyone who wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross every once in a while, on occasion, when I feel like it, or daily. 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 You participate. You're good to go. We're going to particip- participate today, all right? We're going to carry our cross. We're going to carry our cross daily. So we're going to focus on this as we talk about service, about what does it mean to really kind of pick up the mantle as who we are as Christians and to walk that out each and every day. Because, see, I think a lot about what this is, it's just about being conscious of what God has around us already. This is not like some, I don't think, some big mystery secret. All right? I think it's all about just, like I tell my boys all the time, it's about just lifting your head up every once in a while and then just actually taking a look around and looking at the needs of others, because it's pretty easy to see, and a lot of you do a fantastic job about that, because I hear so many stories about like, well, I know someone so needed a ride, or I know somebody needed a meal because they're having surgery, or so-and-so just needed a little pick-me-up, a little attaboy, a pat on the back, needs some words of encouragement, they need some prayer. And you guys are fantastic about that, about just going and just being aware, because see, service is about making a conscious decision to be conscious of others. Pretty simple stuff. Just being conscious of other people kind of opens this door, right? It's about just seeing who is already in your perimeter and engaging in the ways that they need, the way we need, but about the way that they need. This is the service. So what does it mean to have that service every day? Well, I think it's pretty simple because we have Matthew 5, 13 through 16. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and be trampled underfoot, under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Amen. So we have to, we get to be a servant for this job description through service. And it's all, a lot of times what it is, right? It's about being the salt and the light to a dark and tasteless world. Because we have to ask ourselves, I think a poignant question, we're talking about service. Do we just sit in church on Sunday to try to be tasteful, but then head to work on Monday and be tasteless? Because the trick is when we walk outside those doors, do we stop being the church? No. That would be shenanigans. There would be no reason for all this. All right? We walk out of these doors and we go and be the salt and light to the world because that is the job description. That is what God is calling us to. That is the service. Galatians 5, 13 through 14 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And I love that word opportunity. When I'm seeing that word opportunity, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I love this whole aspect of opportunity. Because, see, I think God opens up these opportunities. And we get to make choices each and every day. We have the opportunity to fall back into the old job description. Or we have the opportunity to engage in the new job description, right? And go out and to serve others. We have a conscious choice. And we have to be conscious about those. So as you walked in today, you're going to get to make a conscious decision when you leave here today. So there are nine tables set out in the lobby. And at each of those tables, somebody will be there to greet you. And there are different serving opportunities. We're going to kind of go through there. Because I think a lot of times as a church, we just kind of tell you, like, hey, here's a need. But we really don't kind of do a good job of telling you why the need is so relevant. Right? And as part of my job as an outreach pastor is try to help laser focus people into serving. 
And to my advice to you, to anybody who's looking to serve, serve on a weekly basis. If you don't do that right now, serve on a weekly basis. Just try it out. And then you come back to me and just tell me if I'm crazy or not. I am crazy, so just, you probably just not come to me. All right? But how do we serve? And I'm just saying, serve on a weekly basis. Make that conscious decision. So out in the lobby, we're going to have Kid Street. And so they're looking for people who do work with all the kids. It's an incredible time just about engaging infants through fourth grade. The why is simply because they say, you know, studies show that if you don't reach a kid before like fourth grade, then likely they will not follow Jesus into adulthood. My fourth grade, because they've already kind of set who they are and what they have believed by the time they go into the fourth grade. So they need a lot of people who can come alongside these kids and play. And I mean, I don't know who doesn't like to go play with Play-Doh and crayons, but I mean, she has to kick me out of there every once in a while. All right, so then we also have student ministry. And student ministry is pretty simple. They're just looking for sponsors who can pour into the generation next, right? Studies show that it takes about four to one adults to students to make a long-lasting impact in their lives. So they need a lot of people. And I don't know if you've ever seen a lot of things they do, like they're launching pumpkins, smashing cars, and I guess they're going to play paint wars tonight. I mean, come on. If you don't want to be a part of that, then, I mean, come on. That's crazy. So then we have crossover sports ministry. And this is probably one of our biggest outreaches of the year. So what we're really kind of looking for is people who can come and do concession work, but who also can be coaches. So you don't have to know much about sports. I'll do my best to train you up. If not, i got Dave and Sean who will do a much better job at it. But what reason this is so important is because, especially during the winter basketball season, we got like 500 people, most of which do not come to our church, who flood the gym. Some of those people don't know Jesus. And what an amazing opportunity for you to come to serve with us and to just be able to t- talk to people and then just to show them salt and light. And then next we have our Hawthorne Elementary School Partnership. They're really looking for tutors and people that can partner with teachers to help with any kind of assistance they need. And this is going to be ex- exceedingly important because the, here's how we can ad- engage one-on-one relationships with students and teachers in our very own community to go and show them who Post Road is, but more importantly, who we are as Christians, right? And then we have the crew. Oh, sorry, we have Connections Ministry. And in Connections Ministry, those, they're looking for people who can be greeters out in the lobby. The why this is so important? Because guess what? You get to be the face of the church. That's why they asked me not to do it. All right, they just ask for people, people that, were, that, are, that, that are greeting folks each and every week, especially for those who have never attended here before. How important is that first impression? So we need more people to greet people as they come in. Doug Marshall said he can't do it all on his own. If you don't know who he is, he's a big ball. guy out there, can't miss him. I think he's wearing like complete Colts attire today. Then we have the crew. The crew is a ministry that serves 65 and older and single moms in our community by doing simple projects in their house. And they're just looking for people who can come alongside them, who can help with those various projects. Promise you that there is no experience needed. That's why they let me join. Then we have benevolence. And benevolence is simply just a ministry that comes along people, both family members and those in our community, who are in need of assistance. And they're looking for people who can serve on the Benevolence Board as well as make assistance visits for, for food and for any clothes or something like that that people need. And then we'll also have out there, we'll have Fight Club and Branches. Those are the men's and women's ministry. And why that is so important is because that is what's kind of changing the fabric of who we are as a church by holding men and women accountable in their walk with Christ. About continually teaching what it means to be in the new job description and be the salt and light of the world. And they're looking for both people to participate and both people who can lead and lead others well. So, again, my advice, you may not like it, and that's okay. You need to serve every week. And that's not us trying to fill our quotas or try to fill different serving slots. This is all about just What is a good and positive and healthy routine for you each and every week? Because when you deny yourself, 
when you pick up that cross, then you get to go out and live a a sacrificial calling that God has called us to. So we go back to Luke 9, 23, 25. If anyone wants to follow me, deny himself, take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses life because of me will save it. So we have that deny yourself, take up the cross, and now follow me. So we are called as Christians to a life of sacrifice. We are called to sacrifice because our, our Savior sacrificed for us. Will we sacrifice for Jesus? Because we're kind of at a pinnacle point a lot of times because we're sitting there going, well, now how do I now really sacrifice? How do I give of myself? Because I feel like sometimes we feel like we're overburdened with life, right? We have a lot going on and our schedules are a lot sometimes a little too packed. But it's all about priorities. What am I willing to sacrifice to serve Jesus in the way that he's calling? And in Luke 22, it's pretty interesting because we have the disciples. So they get around and they start arguing with each other because they're going to talk about who's greatest. So they get in this huddle and they start yelling at each other about like, well, who's, going to, who's the greatest among the disciples? And Jesus then pulls them to the side in verses 23 to 27 and says, whoever is the greatest among you shall become like the youngest, become the youngest. And whoever leads like the one serving For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one, next, serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I am among you, but I am among you as the one who serves. So they're sitting here bickering at one another, talking about who's the greatest. And then Jesus confronts them and says, okay, well, okay, whoever's going to be the head of the table, if somebody's at the head of the table, then that's the one that is probably the greatest, right? And they're like, oh yeah, because that's the one being served, kind of like you would see like a king or something like that being served. He would be known as the greatest. But then he goes, ah, plot twist. I'm the greatest. But yet I am the one serving. And then Jesus again just affirms that, that he was the one that has come here to serve, not to be served. And I cannot imagine like how frustrated Jesus was in that moment because this is right, uh, right before the Passover feast. And then really right before this conversation happens, Jesus just got done washing every single one of their feet. He saw that they had dirty feet and he washed them. So he had, grabbed a, he had taken off his outer clothing, grabbed a towel, grabbed a basin, and washed their feet. And then set them aside in John 13, 12 through 17 says, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are speaking rightly since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Where have I given, where have I given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you? Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master. A messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And to me, this is kind of an odd picture, right? Because I want to tell you, like, this is a time before odor eaters. All right? And so Jesus is out here washing people's feet. And just right after that, they start quarreling about who's the greatest. But that is not what we're supposed to be about because he's... He's asking them, like, which one of you are really going to be sacrificial in nature? Because whichever one of you is going to be sacrificial in nature, if that is going to be your serving disposition, then you are the one who is great. The great ones serve. And they serve through humility, patience, and love. Because in John 3, 16 through 18, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. But he has not believed in the name of the one and only name of uh, uh, Son of God. And so here's the gospel of it all, right? Because Jesus knew exactly what he was paying for. And here's where this whole sacrifice thing has come in. All right, because 
Jesus says, well, you accepted me as your Lord, Lord, so I'm going to give you a brand new job description to serve other people, right? And then he makes the next step and says, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and die on a cross for your forgiveness. See, here's the kind of twist in this about the sacrificial living. Because just as you are with a job, would you expect to get hired on a job, see a job description, and then you show up the first day and say, sorry, we have no money to pay you, right? Or do you expect that there's some kind of reserve there that people can pay you regardless, right? And so you show up at your job and you go, okay, Jesus, you gave me this new job description, so what? And he goes, I've already paid your wage with my blood. And that's the gospel of it all. Amen. We're not done participating yet, folks. Amen. Oh, oh, that's what I'm talking about. All right. He has already paid the wage. We just have to accept the job. So will you accept that job today? In Romans 12, 1, it states, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Whatever is worthwhile in this life takes sacrifice. Amen? If you want something really bad, and if it's really worthwhile, you'll make the sacrifice. We know this in our relationships. We know this in our marriage. We know this in our work. If we want something great, there's a sacrifice that needs to be made. But we have to be the ones who do the work. Because we can either hope for a better world, or we can work to make it a better world. We can either hope for a better world, or we can work to make it a better world. Will we do the work? There's nine tables out there that hopes you will. There's a whole kingdom out there that needs you to accept the job. So most of you probably know Rick and Teresa Edwards. Now, you likely know of them because of their servanthood. Because I'll tell you right now, when I first started here at Post, I kind of thought that they were on staff. They were always here. But it's not really about how much they serve. The biggest impression that they've ever made unto me is how they serve. Because they do so with patience. They do so with love, denying of themselves, and making a sacrifice. Because, see, what they are doing right now, even today, upstairs with the kids, up in the booth, is they're leaving a lasting legacy for the next generation. And then that's what we get to do as servants. When we accept the job description, when we pick up that service daily, and then we live in a sacrificial way, we get to build up that next generation. So I'm going to hope today that you accept this calling Accept the job description and do the same. Because God has made you valuable. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are valuable. We need you. You are valuable because of the price that was paid for you on Calvary. So the call is today, deny yourself. Pick up your cross follow him. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come and learn more about the servant, the service, and the sacrifice. Help us each day, Lord, just to take a look around. Notice others, to be conscious of needs, and to walk out our faith as salt and light. Let us not leave here today and just go back to Monday and be tasteless to this world, but rather shine your light and be tasteful 
so that we can show others where the hope is. Lord, you are the great redeemer and we give you all the glory and honor and praise because it is only through you that we have such an awesome opportunity to serve. It is only through you that we get to live out a new job description, that the old job description we can crumple up and we can throw away and then we can just accept the new one. And what a beautiful one it is. And I thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you continue to move PRCC. World, please continue to work through us. Help us to deny ourselves, to pick up our crosses, and to follow you. Amen.